let me just close Hello this. everyone, welcome back ready, to the fox and everyone. the sheep. Welcome back to the fox. <laughs> Sorry, Riga. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome back to the stream. Yep, welcome back. We are back Whoops. at it. And Roka, I know you missed it last week. But yeah, we did. Can you believe it? I absolutely can believe it. And if you it's Friday once again. Hell yeah. It is indeed Hell Friday yeah. once again. And we're back at it with some more Vermintide. Yeah, we made it through the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, made it through. We're at the end of the week now. The weekend's ahead of us. There's a, um, I heard a song. Yeah, yeah. It goes, yeah, the weekend starts here. It's like, it's Let's start deep... this off with a cheers. Yep, I heard a deep bassy voice saying that. Hey, cheers, Roka. But yeah, let's kick on over to the game and Oops, change the game. Man, I, I feel so sticky. Up there. I Come went through like down. three liters of water at we work today. Oh, yikes, is it getting hotter now? Or like a lot hotter sweat. for you? And I sweat all of it back out. Yeah. yeah. I see. Well, I remember that we... Only have one mission left. The White Rat is our next one. Do, 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 do. Because yes. for some reason my workplace traps in the heat really well. One way or another, this ends tonight. I am ready. Yep, let's do this. Turns out this whole attack is under the command of a single Grey Seer. That's the good news. The bad news is that if you want to end this, you're going to have to hunt him in his lair. Like me, he's the brains of the operation and don't willingly put himself at risk. Good hunting to you, and watch out for that bell of his. Am I? Oh, I, I am. I am good with when I'm looking at the screen. Ooh, I thought my um, little sheepy was slightly off center. But ooh, they got them horns. So, In yeah, there's the big bad guy. Kill the raw mage and the pot will scatter. Enough talk. Now so is the we have to kill a rat mage. Crouch, Roka, crouch. Sneaky, the stealth wizard. Yeah, let's go hunt. If we actually stealth, what happens? Doubt nothing. We will prevail. Oh, it gives us a lot of resources. Oh, I got me a bomb. Let I'm gonna take medical supplies. Both here. Oh shit, we're gearing up here. Yep, then we can't come back. Looks like we're going to be placing bombs. So you can't detect my power. Okay, it looks like we've got to run. We can't sneak. Kill Satan, fest a kid. Only then will I give some joy. Oh. oh. Six hours, less than the right. 
Stay together, take them in pairs. Into the Gracie is there. Okay. because it's going to be an infinite spawn. Yes, she's like it. Feels like it. It won't go down like that, Elf. It's okay. Love it. I can take out Storm Vermin as well. Eight bullets to him. But eats all my bullets. Well, get the door open. Oh, I shouldn't be hanging around here. I got no more bullets. <laughs> Where have you gone? Uh, you're, oh, you're around the corner. Cool. Alright, so we can't do it. Good thing is we're getting plenty of healing supplies. Oh, yeah. Somebody go help the dwarf. Well, I guess he's completely yeah. cornered. Well, I've started the um the thing, so I've got um, the door opening. Why won't this one die? Proceed up. Uh -huh. Yeah, he said he's gonna kill us himself. Oh damn, you're hurting. Oh, I am hurting. Give me a moment. So I didn't realize I was hurting that much. They only just started giving me the heartbeat the then. Oh, I'm just gonna... Did you get the healing supplies earlier? Yeah, I did, but um, yep, I'm just going to grab another healing. Actually, there's more here. Do you actually heal up because there's one more hero. Okay? Look, no, no point in me healing up with that one. This body. No, someone took it. I'm gonna go with a fire bomb. Steps going up. Beautiful. Sounds like a plan. Those fire bombs are good. Turn back. Since everyone has the regular ones. Destroy pillar supports the heart so it's everything we've done There's now. More healing here. Oh, excellent. Um I guess we just have to note that it's there. And some ammo as well. Just got. You kill him like you're possessed, sir. Jesus. Oh. Big group of them. I hear that. Lost poison rat. Bad bomb. Be careful. Man, I'm getting swamped to you. Yeah, say I'm getting swamped by Betty. Oh, pick up barrel. 
Oh, I got the barrel. Keep my back safe. Oh. Deliver a barrel. Get it in. Get it in ya. I'm right behind you. Oh. Make some distance, it's gonna blow. And here they come again. Seed up. Bonjour, Miss Army. Was it mono me? Ammunition. Hey there. That Ammunition way. here. Ooh. Dice. Ammunition yep. here. There's, There's a lower book page. Here. Oh, law page. Cool. Healer's tools. I've got the ammo. Cool. I've also got full ammo, so I'm good. Claws skittering on stores. Oh, healing. Oh, there's healing over there. Haha. Uh -huh. Wait, you need that more. Oh, Just a moment. Robotier. Oh. Hold up. We'll do it quickly before Yon turns up. There's more healing down there. Cheers, Batplit. Mm. It means to kill us as it dies. Cheers. Oh, yeah, I can imagine it can't be easy, Batler. That you know you're on the stream here, we're speaking English, then suddenly Thank you are. Um, for watching. You know, someone at work sends you a message fully in French, and you've got to suddenly click change and go, "Oh yeah, don't speak English." <laughs> Ammunition. Yeah. We don't do French here anymore. That, oh. Ah, uh, shit. The game was not connected to Steam. What? Steam, what? Retry. Oh no. Uh, stream still I here. I think I lost connection. Broken connection. Yep. Because as far as I can see, no, there has been some um, frame drops from my end as well. So the stream did drop a few frames. Oh, no. I can hear you moving up there. Come uh, on oh. down. Let's see if we go friends. Roka. Invite. That may not have been then. God is it. Got it. Cool. I have to say, that's the first um, frame drops Damn. in three weeks. If not four weeks now, so it's, you know, I can say my internet's pretty solid now. Hopefully it's yeah, not a that's outage. that's pretty good. And when I say none, I mean none. Well, let's kick this off again. Uh, where was it? It was. We didn't change. Where's this tower? Oh, right, right. There we go. We've had a good run, but the end is in sight. Cool. I have readied up and start. It cost me dear. I kicked all the stuff off the table. <laughs> this whole vermin tide takes its orders from a scaven grey seer, and we know where he is. If you can kill him, you might just save Ubershrike. Watch yourselves though. A grey seer's no pushover, and beware the strike of his bell.
Oh yeah, didn't do any programming um, today either towards VR Sudoku. Friday and I wasn't feeling it. I wasn't feeling like messing up from a Friday. This is a bleak place. It stinks of ruin and the collapse of empires. Yeah, yeah totally fine. There he is there. Yeah. Oh. Some more Damien here. Watch out, that's gonna go bang, Roker. Save some for us. I like how this is like a culmination of everything we've learned throughout the game. Yeah. All the things we've seen already. Yep. Healing here. I need to rally. Get healed up. Grab it. Help. Fingers crossed you don't yeah, drop again. Everyone got their stuff. Let's keep going. Grab a potion. Oh yeah, I see there's more stuff potion. down here. Yep. More mini supplies, cool. Ah, an ammo box. I like an ammo box. That makes me happy. Yeah, I'm gonna go fix up the elf really quick. And take one of those things. Oh. First bell collected. Don't be fooled, they're still a bat. I'm gonna have to fight myself. Oh no, I've... Oh, set the barrel off. Oops. Uh, once you've cut the barrel, you can't drop it, otherwise it becomes explosive. So you've got to do it in one. Yeah. Okay, protect me. I'm going. We so not get hit by the explosion. Incoming pack. 
Oh, that's one place. One's probably hiding in the crowd. Okay. Barrel picked up. Being hooked. Oh, thank you. Be brave as Ungi. Thanks, Ranger. Oh, cool. Are so you with me? Uh, yeah, oh, you've got it. Cool. Oh, Chop the explosion. What? I just fell. I didn't realize there was a hole in the ground. Um, oh, shit. You're gonna have to head right back to the beginning to rescue me. Mm. Oh, yep. <laughs> you think you made it this far without my consent? <laughs> Wait. Oh, they, they just. I? Oh, they teleported down to me or something. Okay, I'm good. The dwarf got me. Sorry about that. Didn't see the hole in the floor and just went down. Haha. Sigma. This Sigma. Sigma. Are there still some healing supplies here? I'll leave them to you. Now never mind. I'm doing Dwarf pretty good. It. I'm doing pretty good health wise myself, so. Yeah, Yo, I'm a bit scratched up. Yes, I fell down that hole there. Broke. Yeah, see this cat right here? Hey, Eddie. Welcome in. Oh, this one. Yep. <laughs> Look, Shalia's gifts. Haha. Uh -huh. Cool. We've got the ammo. Lord book page. Oh, yes, the Lord book page. Gotta grab that. We don't get a dice this time, so that's unfortunate. Yeah, it has been a long time since you've been on stream yeah, with us. That's a shame. Reynolds, oh joy. yeah. Hey there, All Eddie. Here. It's been a while. Okay, so break the chain. And that's where the ogre showed up. Yep. I need to heal, but I couldn't run away either because if I ran, they just chased me. It was a bad call I made. I should have just fought him. Damn. Krillian. Krillian's still alive. Just where are they? Oh, there they are. They're fighting. They might. Yeah. What's she doing? Well, she's attacking the ogre. Oh. Head on. <laughs> Yeah, that's very smart. Nah, she's not making it. Yep, she got knocked off. Oh, she fell. 
Yep, there you go. Damn. Defeated. Okay, this is the first one that's actually been a struggle. We need to, I guess, not rush it and actually pull back. Once we break the first one, pull back and let, let him come to us and fight in a not small area. Because if he whacks us round, that's a problem. Yeah. So let's just go yep, straight back to the same one so we don't need to head back to the inn. Yeah. It cost me dearly, but I reckon we got a chance of ending this. This whole vermin tide takes its orders from a skaven grey seer. Don't want to hear what the barkeeper is. has if to say about us it, failing. You might just save Uvershrike. Watch yourselves though. A grey seer's no pushover, and beware the strike of his bell. Can't skip it. Is this? To go around. Have the Skaven some influence over the moon? Yes, you did. <laughs> Time to put an end to this. I should use my oh, use my bomb as well. Wait, it's... shit. Nah, I can still get a bomb. I see they've been living underground this whole time. It's not by my hand. Save some for us. We go, let's do this real quick. Can you hear it gnawing at your bellies? Destroy the yeah, let's go. Let's smash some heads in. In. He's gonna be somewhere. Through this door. What's the oh, matter? Was there another medical supplies here? There was, I'm gonna. Let me heal up. Heal up. Grab the medical. Let's shoot to reload the gun. Nice. And let's go up. Healing draft. Is there anything out here? 
Ammunition, oh. medical supplies here. Oh, there's medical. Okay. Blessed. Health. Right. Yeah, more meds. That's yep. it. I'm gonna heal up. Get to full health. Let's do this. Keep focused. Stay in the game. Yep. Keep focused, broker. Keep focused. Yeah. Let's fucking go. Okay, do we want to grab this first barrel here? I've got it. Oh, can't walk through the enemies. Oh no. But I gotta to toss it, they whack my barrel. Yeah. I'll have had a barrel explode in my hands. Oh shit. <laughs> okay, I'll try the next barrel. Yeah, not cool. Okay, barrel collected. Time for some rat catches. Leave them in sway! Oh, no. oh shit. Okay. Watch your back! Let's try this again. Get you out of the way. Grab the barrel. Start moving. More potions. Oh. Rex. Oh, but they may have whacked me, but I have enough time to get here and placed. First one placed. Second one got. Ah, a bomb! That'll wreak some carnage. Sounds like a rattling gun. At the rat beasts! Placed. Ah. Alright, there goes the bell. That is going to be, gonna be the influx of enemies. And here is more. Where is he? Vermin swarm. Go down there. That's oh, where he's no. shooting us from. Barrel activated. <laughs> Bam. Oops. Right behind your rocket. Be careful you don't get hit. <laughs> yep, yeah, cool. I've got your back safe. You're good. Nice. Three or three. And. That replaced. Oh, you actually, actually, no, you need that more than I do. replaced. There's ammunition here. There's a low boot. Ammunition page. here. Oh, yeah, there's a little page down there, and there's a little page up here. Watch out, gas. Nice. Look out, gas attack. Where's the little page down here? Oh, there it is. Uh -huh. Watch those globes. In that barrel back there. Yep, yeah, found it. It's going to explode. I've got no. my ammo. Homecoming this turned out to be. Stay alert. There's a gas rat. Oh, 
Only the chains remain. One last effort. Okay. No, so I'm gonna hit across. Let's start on the sun. And I'm gonna hit backwards. Yep, so I'm gonna hit back the way we came. Yeah. They all have to cross the gap to get us, so they all have to do their jump animation, which slows them down for just a bit. Yeah, let's deal with this one here yep. first. Yep, red ogre coming. Fire like that. Red Let's see what my strength potion has to say about that. Wow, that was too late. My eight bullets of doom. Spinning doom. What? What? Oh, no, don't fall off. Oof. Okay, I am now over onto solid ground. Man, they really did a number on our elf. Oh, watch out for that lightning. Gotta be some health around here soon. The gunner is tracking me. The elf's down again. Oh, you got the elf. Good men oh, before, you know, so I you do so me. now. Yeah. Final anchor point. Question is, is there any health nearby versus going for the anchor point? More potions. Potion of strength, oh, not sickness. No. Okay, I think we we'll start working. Wow. Oh, lightning bolt. So that with their leader nice. slain, the treacherous Skaven tore one another apart in a bid to take his place, or else fled in search of easier pickings. At last, the survivors of Ubersrike emerged to reclaim their shattered home. This was a victory, but no one had the strength to celebrate. Clan Fester's assault was but a taste, a foreshadowing of what was to come. 
The battle for Uberstrike had been won, but the war had barely begun. The fires of Uberstrike were a signal. As the city burned, the borders of the Empire came under siege. From Skaven, from the Chaos Warriors of the North, and from the living dead. These are the end times. Ooh, the end times. I <laughs> love how one of our characters shout out, Potion here, right at the end. <laughs> Yeah. There, another level up and a longbow. Three pages. I only got two pages. Damn. Let's see what we get though. Roll and I rolled a zero. <laughs> wow. Two. And it doesn't look like it's something for me either because these it dice is are not exactly on our side i feel a beam staff these dice are not on our side at all so headshots i got a lot of headshots but i do have a headshot and kind of sword that like purposely like headshots damage dealt yes i killed a lot of things boss damage that bomb at the beginning and then the rapid fire gun just threw damage into him Melee, I didn't kill too much, about the same as you. Clan kills, yeah, we're all kind of in the middle. Damage taken, yeah, I took quite a bit of damage I though. I got all the storm vermin. With my armor piercing. Yep. So just regular kills, range kills was all Eurocus special. Didn't kill anything special. Storm vermin, yep, all you. I killed three and heroes aided, while Roka being the team leader he aiding everyone versus me just not aiding anyone so next the horn of magnus right so that loops right back to the beginning so if we go back to the well end. you were carrying the bombs and i think that was where i aided you ah right because yeah you were like protecting me so you got heaps of aid yeah So what's through here? Look at that. Oh yeah, so yeah, we've got those kind of additional missions and stuff here, the bounty board. Um. To try and, yeah, unlock various things. Get more items or crafting materials. So if we go to it, yes, yeah, so everything's done there. Um. How do we go back? Oh, back. Because I did notice there's death on the Reich as well. Reichvold Forest and River Reich. We could do them, cool. or we could jump because it's about an hour in into part two of the stream. Hell yet. We could do those next week. I guess, yeah, make sure we've got next week's game also lined up as well. Because there are only two missions. Oh, yeah. With them, that's, yep, DLC, DLC, and DLC. If I click it, oh, I immediately, right, just opens up. But we've up. got time for that over the weekend. Yeah, 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 over the weekend we can download it, get it ready and all that kind of stuff. That's not a problem. To get some downloads going. Mm -hmm. But I have a question. Bapler. Are you, are you still around, Bapler? All right. Time for a stretch.
I'll jump back to the pair of us just for now. And we'll hit some buttons here to shift that over to there. I wonder if I hit reload here, is it going to do what I want it to do? It is. I can bloop that like that nice. and bloop that. I guess we do not have a battler with us at the moment, but that is fine. I've got us with some BG well, music going on. That's fine. Please with us in spirit, I'm sure. Yep. Everyone who's been with us, all oh, 140 something are with us in spirit. We also had Hagrid um, follow us um, seven hours ago. Oh. Like, yeah. And they're not just like some random odd follow. I, I don't know them. I don't think I know them. And yeah, they seem to stream themselves. Like they've got a bunch of followers themselves. It's just, they just followed. So thanks, Hagrid. Well, thank you. But yeah, you had something for us to do for the second half of the stream. All right, let's see if I can find the thing I had for you. I guess if you want, you can, yep, redeem it without putting anything in there and send me details on- Because um, there were a bunch of them that were specifically not that thing. On Discord, oh, if you want. Cheers. But yeah, cheers, Batplit. Oh no, yep. the page isn't loading. And actually, now that I know we have a Batplit, Batplit, can you believe what time it is? Because I know we can. Is indeed Friday once again. Yep, it's really good at sneaking up on you. I'm finding a bunch of reviews, but I can't find the real thing. Ah, interesting. I heard it already somewhere. Do you want to send its name over to me on Discord? But that page is not loading. So I can at least, um... Yep, one second. I can also just take a little bit of a look as well. Shrink that down. There's the name. Because, you know, I might get slightly different results searching from New Zealand. Is this a... That one's not loading. There's this link here where I got it from last time. Oh, I think I've just found it. I just want you to confirm this is it. Yep, I saw that link, but I have just found that link. Is that the same book? Let's see.
There it is, the first one. Oh, so it's just that first section. The Joyce Armstrong fragment. Yep, so is it just the horror section? And just stopping once I reach the leather funnel. Because, like, scrolling on this. Yeah, the Tales of Terror Mystery is like the whole book. That's a bunch of short stories, I'm guessing. With these short stories in them. Right. And the first one is the one we are looking for. Right, I was about to say, I started scrolling and looked at the scroll and went, it's not moving. <laughs> now, if I plop that up there, I just need to figure out a way. Oh, yes, it does resize the text. It doesn't just push it off the edge of the screen. Haha. <laughs> And get it nice and big. Nice. So I don't have to, you know, it's easy to kind of keep my position and things. Now, the question is, do you want the text on screen or should it just be us just sitting next to each other just reading? Because like, if I, I think do... I like the text on screen for this one. Okay, cool. Let's copy that then. And we will shift it on over to my stream browser. Oh, actually, that's the question. Stream browser about Google Chrome. And it's out of date. Just want to let my web browser up to date just so it's more secure. Let's zoom right in like that. And it is now we want the chrome scene. Is there there? We unhide the Roka stream. Oh, did I change yourself? Why are you not cropped correctly on this one? I guess I didn't crop you quite right. Okay, hold up one second. I'll need to crop you. Edit transform. Uh, we want to take a bit off the top and a bit off the left. Now, there is no black bar. Perfect. Let's expand this vertically a bit nice so it looks good like that and also whoa shrink it a bit so it looks good like that now i have one more request of you roka and that's to actually redeem as well i refuse, got it. <laughs> I refuse to read without re the redemption gotta prove you've actually got it <laughs> I don't deny you've got enough. You've got you've got the most of anyone. Thingy. Perfect. Oh yeah, I don't have um the stuff up as well on this one. So what's that? Song Chris wanted. Rule text. The stuff. Interesting. And Roka picture. Huh. This is a very old um scene that I have. Well, I need to update the scene with new things in it. Because <laughs> it doesn't have any of the um, like pop-up stuff. But yeah, let's bring this front and center. And... Oh, you mean the alert boxes? Yeah, all the alert boxes and things. Don't alert box on this one. I'm going to change it from synthwave music over to lo-fi. Because I feel that's a bit more kind of forthcoming with this of reading. Oh, and let's change the category we're in as well. What are we doing? Edit stream All info. right. If I type in... 
reading. I think that puts us in just chatting. Is reading a thing? No, it is not. There's not a category of just like reading. There are games called yeah, like reading with things and all that kind of stuff. So it says. And the sheep and the fox read a short story. Done. Cool. That pops us over to well, a new category. It's mostly just the sheep. Yeah, but you're here. I got emotional support. So that's yep, cool, that's working, it's scrolling. Nice. So Good call on the rehydrate. Let's get you hydrated first. Cheers. I will also be taking free sips throughout this just to remain hydrated as well. <clears throat> just where I need. Of course. <clears throat> oh, so I just gonna stretch it out. Oh. So this is the Tales of Terror. Yet everyone do a post-church check. Yep. And it's not post-church, but posture. If you haven't been to church, you don't need to do the post-church check. You just need to check your posture. Haha. -ha. But yeah, so this is Tales of Terror and Mystery by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Actually, let's do this properly. Tales of Terror and Mystery by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Ha uh ha. -huh. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> okay, so we will be reading The Horror of the Heights. That's the right one, right, Roker? It is The Horror of the Heights? Yep, that's the one. I'm going to lean a bit more into the microphone a bit, just so it's closer up. Because it's it's not so bad when I'm kind of right up next to it now. It kind of works it better so I can get, it'll pick up the voice the best it can. The Horror of the Heights. The idea that the extraordinary narrative, which has been called the Joyce Armstrong Fragment, is an elaborate practical joke evolved by some unknown person cursed by a pervaded and sinister sense of humour has now been abandoned by all who have examined the matter. The most macabre and imaginative of plotters would hesitate before linking his morbid fancies with the unquestioned and tragic facts which reinforce the statement. Through the assertions contained in it are amazing and even monstrous, it is nonetheless forcing itself upon the general intelligence that they are true and that we must readjust our ideas to the new situation. This world of ours appears to be separated by a slight and precarious margin of safety from a most singular and unexpected danger. I will endeavour in this narrative, which reproduces the original document in its necessarily somewhat fragmentary form to lay before the reader the whole of the facts up to date, prefacing my statement by saying that if there be any who doubt the narrative of Joyce Armstrong, there can be no question at all as to the facts concerning Lieutenant Myrtle R. N. and Mr. Hay Connor, who undoubtedly met their end in the manner described. The Joyce Armstrong fragment was found in the field which is called Lower Haycock, lying one mile to the westward of the village of Wytham, up the Kent and Sussex border. It was on the 15th of September last that an agricultural labourer, James Flynn, in the employment of Matthew Dodd, farmer of the Chauntry Farm. Wytham perceived a briar pipe lying near the footpath which skirts the, which skirts the hedge in Lower Haycock. 
A few places farther on, he picked up a pair of broken binocular glasses. Finally, among some nettles, oh, yeah, finally, among some nettles in a ditch, he caught sight of a flat, canvas-backed book, which proved to be a notebook with detachable leaves, some of which had come loose and were fluttering along the base of the hedge. These he collected, but some, including the first, were never recovered, and leave a deplorable hiatus in this all-important statement. The notebook was taken by the labourer to his master, who in turn showed it to Dr. J. H. Atherton of Hartfield. This gentleman once recognised the need for an expert examination and the manuscript was forwarded to the Aero Club in London, where it now lies. The first two pages of the manuscript are missing. There is also one torn away at the end of the narrative, though none of these affect the general coherence of the story. It is conjectured that the missing opening is concerned with the record of Mr. Joyce Armstrong's qualifications as an aeronaut, which can be gathered from other sources and are admitted to be unsurpassed among the air pilots of England. For many years, he has been looked upon as among the most daring and the most intellectual of flying men, a combination which has enabled him to both invent and test several new devices, including the common gyroscopic attachment, which is known by his name. The main body of the manuscript is written in neatly is written neatly in ink, but the last few lines are in pencil and are so ragged as to be hardly legible. Exactly, in fact, as they might be expected to appear if they were scribbled off hurriedly from the seat of a moving aeroplane. There are, it may be added, several stains, both on the last page and on the outside cover, which have been pronounced by the Home Office experts to be blood, probably human and certainly mammalian. The fact that something closely resembling the organism of malaria was discovered in this blood, and that Joyce Armstrong is known to have suffered from intermittent fever, is a remarkable example of the new weapons which modern science has placed in the hands of our detectives. And now, a word as to the personality of the author of this epoch-marking statement, Joyce Armstrong, according to the few friends who really knew something of the man, was a poet and a dreamer, as well as a mechanic and an inventor. He was a man of considerable wealth, much of which he had spent in the pursuit of his aeronautical hobby. He had four private aeroplanes in his hangars near Devies and is said to have made no fewer than 170 ascents in the course of the last year. He was a retiring man with dark moods in which he would avoid the society of his fellows. Captain Dangerfield, who knew him better than anyone, says that there were times when his eccentricity threatened to develop into something more serious. His habit of carrying a shotgun with him in his aeroplane was one manifestation of it. Another was the morbid effect in which the fall of Lieutenant Myrtle had upon his mind. Myrtle, who was attempting the height record, fell from an altitude of something over 30,000 feet. Horrible to narrate, his head was entirely obliterated, though his body and limbs preserved their configuration. At every gathering of airmen, Joyce Armstrong, according to Dangerfield, would ask with an enigmatic smile, And where, pray, is Myrtle's head? On another occasion, after dinner, at the mess of the Flying School of Salisbury Plain, he started a debate as to what will be the most permanent danger which airmen will have to encounter. Having listened to successive opinions, 
as to air pockets, faulty construction and overbanking, he ended by shrugging his shoulders and refusing to put forward his own views. Though he gave the impression that they differed from any advanced by his companions. It is worth remarking that after his own complete disappearance, it was found that his private affairs were arranged with a precision which may show that he had a strong premonition of disaster. With these essential explanations, I will now give the narrative exactly as it stands, beginning at page 3 of the blood-soaked notebook. <clears throat> Nevertheless, when I dined at Rhymes with Cosili and Gustav Raymond, I found that neither of them was aware of any particular danger in the higher layers of the atmosphere. I did not actually say what was in my thoughts, but I got so near to it that if they had any corresponding idea, they could not have failed to express it. But then, they are too empty. Vainglorious fellows, with no thought beyond seeing their silly names in the newspaper. It is interesting to note that neither of them have ever been much beyond the 20,000 foot level. Of course, men have been higher than this, both in balloons and in the ascent of mountains. It must be well above that point that the aeroplanes enters the danger zone, always presuming that my premonitions are correct. Aeroplaning has been with us now for more than 20 years, and one might well ask, what should this peril be only revealing itself in our day? The answer is obvious. In the old days of weak engines, when a 100 horsepower gnome or green was considered ample for every need, the flights were very restricted. Now that 300 horsepower is the rule rather than the exception, Visits to the upper layers have become easier and more common. Some of us can remember how, in our youth, Garros made a worldwide reputation by attaining 19,000 feet, and it was considered a remarkable achievement to fly over the Alps. Our standard has now been immeasurably raised, and there are 20 high flights for one in former years. Many of them have been undertaken with impunity. The 30,000 foot level has been reached time after time with no discomfort beyond cold and asthma. What does this prove? A visitor might descend upon this planet a thousand times and never see a tiger, yet tigers exist. And if he chanced to come down into a jungle, he might be devoured. There are jungles of the upper air and there are worse things than tiger which inhabit them. I believe in time they will map these jungles accurately out. Even at the present moment, I could name two of them. One of them lives over the Pau Birats district of France, or the Poubira district of France. Another is just over my head as I write here in my house in Wiltshire. I'd rather think there is a third in the Homburg Weisbanden district. It was the disappearance of the airmen that first set me thinking. Of course, everyone said that they had fallen into the sea, but that did not satisfy me at all. First, there was Verrier in France. His machine was found near Bayonne, but they never got his body. There was the case of Baxter also, who vanished through his engine, who vanished, though his engine and some of the iron fixings were found in a wood in Leicestershire. In that case, Dr. Middleton of Amesbury, who was watching the flight with a telescope, declares that just before the clouds obscured the view, he saw the machine, which was at an enormous height, suddenly rise perpendicularly upwards in a succession of jerks in a manner that he would have thought to be impossible. That was the last scene of Baxter. There was a correspondence in the papers, but it never led to anything. There were several other similar cases, and then there was the death of Hay Connor. 
what a cackle there was about an unsolved mystery of the air and what columns in the half penny papers oh, and what columns in the half penny papers and yet how little was ever done to get to the bottom of the business he came down in a tremendous volplane from an unknown height he never got off his machine and died in his pilot's seat died of what heart disease said the doctors rubbish hey connor's heart was as sound as mine is what did venables say venables was the only man who was at his side when he died he said that he was shivering and looked like a man who had been badly scared died of fright said venables but could not imagine what he was frightened about only said one word to venables which sounded like monstrous they could make nothing of that at the inquest but i could make something of it monsters that was the last word of poor harry hay connor and he did die of fright just as vulnerables thought and there was myrtle's head do you really believe does anybody really believe that a man's head could be driven clean into his body by the force of a fall? Well, perhaps it may be possible, but I, for one, have never believed that it was so with Myrtle and the grease upon his clothes, all slimy with grease. And somebody at the inquest said, I oh, said somebody at the inquest. Queer that nobody got thinking after that. I did, but then i'd been thinking for a good long time i've made three ascents how about dangerfield how dangerfield used to chaff me about my shotgun but i've never been high enough now with this new light paul verona machine and it's 175 rover i should easily touch the 30,000 tomorrow i'll have a shot at the record Maybe I shall have a shot at something else as well. Of course, it's dangerous. If a fellow wants to avoid dangers, he best keep out of flying altogether and subside finally into flannel slippers and a dressing gown. But I'll, vi I'll visit the air jungle tomorrow and if there's anything there, I shall know it. If I return, I'll find myself a bit of a celebrity. If I don't, this notebook may explain what I'm trying to do and how I lost my life in doing it. But no drivel about accidents or mysteries, if you please. <clears throat> I chose my Paul Verena monoplane for the job. There's nothing like a monoplane when real work is to be done. Beaumont found that out in very early days. For one thing, it doesn't mind damp. And the weather looks... It doesn't mind damp. And the weather looks as if we should be in the clouds all the time. It's a bonny little model and answers my hand like a tender-mouthed horse. The engine is a 10-cylinder rotary rover working up to 175. It has all the modern improvements, enclosed fuselage, high-curved landing skids, brakes, gyroscopic steadiers, and three speeds worked by an alteration of the angle of the planes upon the Venetian blind principle. I took a shotgun with me and a dozen cartridges filled with buckshot. You should have seen the face of Perkins, my old mechanic, when I directed him to put them in. I was dressed like an Arctic explorer with two jerseys under my overalls, thick socks inside my padded boots, a storm cap with flaps and my talc goggles. It was stifling outside the hangars, but I was going for the summit of the Himalayas and had to dress for the part. <clears throat> Perkins knew there was something on and implored me to take him with me. Perhaps I should if I were using the biplane, but a monoplane is a one-man show. If you want to get the last foot of life out of it, of course, I took an oxygen bag. The man who goes for the altitude record with that one will either be frozen or smothered or both. Oh, um, 
I'll take a free sip. You don't need to do anything, Batplit. Hmm. Cheers. Cheers. <clears throat> I had a good look at the planes, the rudder bar, and the elevating lever before I got in. Everything was in order, so far as I could see. Then I switched on my engine and found that she was running sweetly. When they let her go, she rose almost at once upon the lowest speed. I circled my home field once or twice just to warm her up, and then, with a wave to Perkins and the others, I flattened out my planes and put her on the highest. She skimmed like a swallow, downwind for 8 or 10 miles, until I turned her nose up a little and she began to climb in a great spiral for the cloud bank above me. It's all important to rise slowly and adapt yourself to the pressure as you go. It was a close, warm day for an English September, and there was the hush and heaviness of impending rain. Now and then, there came sudden puffs of wind from the southwest, one of them so gusty and unexpected that it caught me napping and turned me half round for an instant. I remember the time when gusts and whirls and air pockets used to be things of danger before we learned to put an overmastering power into our engines. Just as I reached the cloud banks with the altimeter marking 3000, down came the rain. My word, how it poured! It drummed upon my wings and lashed against my face, blurring my glasses so I could hardly see. I got down onto a low speed, for it was painful to travel against it. As I got higher, it became hail and I had to turn tail to it. One of my cylinders was out of action, a dirty plug, I should imagine. But I was still rising steadily with plenty of power. After a bit, the trouble passed, whatever it was, and I heard the full, deep-throated purr, the tin singing as one. That's where the beauty of our modern silences comes in. We can last control our engines by ear, how they squeal and squeak and sob when they are in trouble. All those cries for help were wasted in the old days when every sound was swallowed up by the monstrous racket of the machine. If only the early aviators could come back to see the beauty and perfection of the mechanism which we have been brought at the cost of their lives. About 9.30, I was nearing the clouds. Down below me, all blurred and shadowed with rain, lay the vast expanse of Salisbury Plain. Half a dozen flying machines were doing hack work at the thousand foot level, looking like little black swallows against the green background. Dare I say, they were wondering what I was doing up in the cloudland. Suddenly, a grey curtain drew across beneath me, and the wet folds of vapours were swirling round my face. It was clamorly cold and miserable, but I was above the hailstorm, and that was something gained. The cloud was as dark and thick as a London fog. In my anxiety to get clear, I cocked her nose up until the automatic alarm bell rang, and I actually began to slide backwards. My sopped and dripping wings had made me heavier than I thought, but presently I was in lighter cloud and soon had cleared the first layer. There was a second, opal-coloured and fleecy, at a great height above my head, a white, unbroken ceiling above and a dark, unbroken floor below. With the monoplane labouring upwards upon a vast spiral between them, it is deadly lonely in these cloud spaces. Once a great flight of some small water birds went past me, flying very fast to the westwards. The quick whir of their wings and their musical cry were cheery to my ear. I fancy that they were teal, but I'm, I'm a wretched zoologist. Now that we humans have become birds, we must really learn to know our brethren by sight. 
The wind down beneath me whirled and swayed the broad cloud plain. Once a great eddy formed in it, a whirlpool of vapour, and through it, as down a funnel, I caught sight of the distant world. A large white biplane was passing at a vast depth beneath me. I fancy it was the morning mail service betwixt Bristol and London. Then the drift swirled inwards again and the great solitude was unbroken. Just after 10, I touched the lower edge of the upper cloud stratum. It consisted of fine diaphan diaphanous vapour drifting swiftly from the westwards. The wind had been steadily rising all this time and it was now blowing a sharp breeze. 28 and hour by my gauge. Oh, 28 an hour by my gauge. Already it was very cold, though my altimeter only marked 9,000. The engines were working beautifully and went droning steadily upwards. The cloud bank was thicker than I had expected, but at last it thinned out into a golden mist before me. And then, in an instant, I had shot out from it, and there was an unclouded sky and a brilliant sun above my head, all blue and gold above, all shining silver below. One vast, glimmering plain as far as my eyes could reach. It was a quarter past ten o'clock, and the barograph needle pointed to 12,800. Up I went, and oh, up I went and up, my ears concentrated upon the deep purring of my motor, my eyes busy, always with the watch, the revolution indicator, the petrol lever, and the oil pump. No wonder aviators are said to be a fearless race. With so many things to think of, there is no time to travel about oneself. About this time, I noted how unreliable is the compass when above a certain height from Earth. At 15,000 feet, mine was pointing east and a point south. The sun and the wind gave me my true bearings. I had hoped to reach an eternal stillness in these high altitudes, but with every thousand feet of ascent, the gale grew stronger. My machine groaned and trembled in every joint and rivet as she faced it, and swept away like a sheet of paper when I banked her on the turn, <coughs> skimming downwind at a greater pace. Perhaps than ever mortal man has moved, yet I had always to turn again and tack up in the wind's eye, for it was not merely a height record that I was after. By all my calculations, it was above Little Wiltshire that my air jungle lay, and all my labour might be lost if I struck the outer layers at some farther point. When I reached the 19,000 foot level, which was about midday, the wind was so severe that I looked with some anxiety to the stays of my wings, expecting momentarily to see them snap or slacken. I even cast loose the parachute behind me and fastened its hook into the ring of my leathened belt so as to be ready for the worst. <clears throat> now was the time when a bit of scampled work or scampered work by the mechanic is paid for by the life of the aeronaut, but she held together bravely. Every chord and strut was humming and vibrating like so many harp strings, but it was glorious to see how, for all the beating and buffeting, she was still the conqueror of nature and the mistress of the sky. There is surely something divine in man himself that he should rise so superior to the limitations which creation seemed to impose. Rise, too, by such unselfish, heroic devotion as this air conquest has shown. Talk of human degeneration. When has such a story as this been written in the annals of our race? These were the thoughts in my head as I climbed that monstrous, inclined plane with the wind sometimes beating in my face and sometimes whistling behind my ears, 
while the cloud land beneath me fell away to such a distance that the folds and hummocks of silver had all smoothed and out into one flat, shining plain. But suddenly, I had a horrible and unprecedented experience. I have known before what it is to be in what our neighbours have called a torbillion, but never on such a scale as this. The huge, that huge sweeping river of wind which I have spoken had, as it appears, whirlpools within it which were as monstrous as itself. Without a moment's warning, I was dragged suddenly into the heart of one. I spun round for a minute or two with such velocity that I almost lost my senses, and then fell suddenly, left wing foremost, down, the vacuum funnel in the center. I dropped like a stone and lost nearly a thousand feet. It was only my belt that kept me in my seat and the shock and breathlessness left me hanging half ins insensible over the side of the fuselage. But I am always capable of a supreme effort, as my one great merit as an aviator. I was conscious that the descent was slower, the whirlpool was a cone rather than a funnel, and I had come to the apex. With a terrific wrench, throwing my weight all to one side, I levelled my planes and brought her head away from the wind. In an instant, I had shot out of the eddies and was skimming down the sky. Then, shaken but victorious, I turned her nose up and began once more my steady grind on the upward spiral. I took a large sweep to avoid the danger spot of the whirlpool and soon I was safely above it. Just after one o'clock, I was 21,000 feet above the sea level. To my great joy, I had topped the gale, and with every hundred feet of ascent, the air grew stiller. On the other hand, it was very cold, and I was conscious of that particular nausea which goes with rarefaction of the air. For the first time, I unscrewed the mouth of my oxygen bag and took an occasional whiff of the glorious gas. I could feel it running like a cordial through my veins, and I was exhilarated almost to the point of drunkenness. I shouted and sang as I soared upwards into the cold, still outer world. It is very clear to me that in the insensibility which came upon Glacier, and in the lesser degree upon Coxwell, when, in 1862, they ascended in a balloon to the height of 30,000 feet, was due to the extreme speed with which a perpendicular ascent is made. Doing it at an easy gradient and accustoming oneself to the lessed barometric pressure by slow degrees, there are no such dreadful symptoms. At the same great height, I found that even without my oxygen inhaler, I could breathe without undue distress. It was bitterly cold, however, and my thermometer was at zero Fahrenheit. At 1.30 I was nearly seven miles above the surface of the earth, and still ascending steadily. I found, however, that the rare field air was giving markedly less support to my plane, and that my angle of ascent had to be considerably lowered in consequence. It was already clear that even with my lightweight and strong engine power, there was a point in front of me where I should be held. To make matters worse, one of my sparking plugs was in trouble again, and there was intermittent misfiring in the engine. My heart was heavy with the fear of failure. It was about that time that I had a most extraordinary experience. Something whizzed past me in a trail of smoke and exploded with a loud hissing sound, sending forth a cloud of steam. For the instant, I could not imagine what had happened. Then I remembered that the earth is forever being bombarded by meteor stones and would be hardly inhabitable were they not in nearly every case turned to vapour in the outer layers of the atmosphere. Here is the new danger for the high altitude man, for two others passed me when I was nearing the 40,000 foot mark. 
I cannot doubt that at the edge of the Earth's envelope, the risk would be a very real one. My barograph needle marked 41,300 when I became aware that I could go no farther. Physically, the strain was not as yet greater than I could bear, but my machine had reached its limit. The attenuated air gave no firm support to the wings, and the least tilt developed into side slip while she seemed sluggish on her controls. Possibly, had the engine been at its best, another thousand feet might have been within our capacity, but it was still misfiring, and two out of the ten cylinders appeared to be out of action. If I had not already reached the zone for which I was searching, then I should never see it upon this journey. But it was not possible that I had attained it. Soaring in circles like a monstrous hawk upon the 40,000 foot level, I let the monoplane guide herself, and with my Manheim glass, I made a careful observation of my surroundings. The heavens were perfectly clear. There was no indication of those dangers which I had imagined. <clears throat> I have said that I was soaring in circles. It struck me suddenly that I would do well to take a wider sweep and open up a new air tract. If the hunter entered an earth jungle, he would drive through it if he wished to find his game. My reasoning had led me to believe that the air jungle which I had imagined lay somewhere over Wiltshire should be to the south and west of me. I took my bearings from the sun, for the compass was hopeless and no trace of earth was to be seen. Nothing but the distant silver cloud plain. However, I got my direction as best I might and kept her head straight to the mark. I reckoned that my petrol supply would last would not last me for more than another hour or so, but I could afford to use it to the last drop, since a single magnificent volplane could at any time take me to the earth. Suddenly, I was aware of something new. The air in front of me had lost its crystal clearness. It was full of long, ragged wisps of something which I could only compare to the very fine cigarette smoke. It hung about in wreaths and coils, turning and twisting, slowly in the sunlight. As the monoplane shot through it, I was aware of a faint taste of oil upon my lips, and there was a greasy scum upon the woodwork of the machine. Some infinitely fine organic matter appeared to be suspended in the atmosphere. There was no life there, it was incohit and diffuse, extending for many square acres, and then fringing off into the void. No, it was not life, but it might not be the remains of life. Above all, it might not be the food of life, of monstrous life. Even as the humble grease of the ocean is the food for the mighty whale, the thought was in my mind when my eyes looked upward and I saw the most wonderful vision that ever man has seen. Can I hope to convey it to you as I saw it myself last Thursday? Conceive a jellyfish such as sails in our summer seas, bell-shaped and of enormous size, far larger, I should judge, than the dome of St. Paul's. It was of a light pink-coloured vein with a delicate green, but the whole huge fabric so tenuous that it was but a fairy outlined against the dark blue sky. It pulsated with a delicate and regular rhythm. From there it depended. Yep, it depended two long drooping green tentacles from which swayed slowly backwards and forwards. This gorgeous vision passed gently with noiseless dignity over my head as light and fragile as a soap bubble, and drifted upon its stately way. I had half turned my monoplane that I might look after this beautiful creature when, in a moment, I found myself amidst a perfect fleet of them, of all sizes, but none so large as the first. Some were quite small, 
but the majority, about as big as an average balloon and with much the same curvature as the top. There was in them a delicacy of texture and colouring which reminded me of the finest Venetian glass. Pale shades of pink and green were the prevailing tints, but all had a lovely iridescence where the sun shimmered through their dainty forms. Some hundreds of them drifted past me, a wonderful fairy squadron of strange unknown argosies of the sky, creatures who fought, whose forms and substance were so attuned to these pure heights that one could not conceive of anything so delicate with an actual sight or sound of earth. But soon my attention was drawn to a new phenomenon, blah, 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 phenomenon, the serpents of the outer air. These were long, thin, fantastic coils of vapour-like material which turned and twisted with great speed, flying round and round at such a pace that the eyes could hardly follow them. Some of these ghost-like creatures were 20 or 30 feet long, but it was difficult to tell their girth. Oh, can you get them, Rokit? Their girth, for the outline, was so hazy that it seemed to fade away into the air around them. These air snakes were of a very light grey or smoke colour, with some darker lines within. Wait, I got him. Uh, so it goes, with some darker lines within, which gave the impression of a definite organism. One of them whisked past my face, and I was conscious of a cold, clammy contact. But their composition was so unsubstantial, unsubstantial that I could not connect them with any thoughts of physical danger any more than the beautiful bell-like creatures which had preceded them. There was no more solidity in their frames than the floating spume from a broken wave. But a more terrible experience was in store for me. Floating downwards from a great height, there came a purplish patch of vapour, small as I saw at first, but rapidly enlarging as it approached me, until it appeared to be hundreds of square feet in size. Though fashioned of some transparent, jelly-like substance, it was nonetheless of much more definite outline and solid consistence than anything which I'd seen before. There were more traces too of a physical organization. Oh, yeah, organization, especially two vast, shadowy, circular plates upon either side, which may have been eyes and a perfectly solid white projection between them, which is as curved and as cruel as the beak of a vulture. The whole aspect of this monster was formidable and threatening, and it kept changing its colour from a very light mauve to a dark, angry purple, so thick that it cast a shadow as it drifted between my monoplane and the sun. On the upper curve of its huge body, there were three great projections, which I can only describe as enormous bubbles, and I was convinced as I looked at them that they were charged with some extremely light gas which served to buoy up the misshapen and semi-solid mass in the rare field air. The creature moved swiftly along, keeping pace easily with the monoplane, and for 20 miles or more it formed my horrible escort hovering over me like a bird of prey which is waiting to pounce. Its method of progression, done so swiftly that it was not easy to follow, was to throw out a long, gluttonous stream in front of it, which in turn seemed to draw forward the rest of its writhing body, so elastic and gelatinous that it was never for two successive minutes was it the same shape, and yet each change made it more threatening and loathsome than the last. I knew that it meant mischief, Every purple flush of its hideous body told me so. The vague, goggling eyes, which were turned always upon me, were cold and merciless in their viscid hatred. I dipped the nose of my monoplane downward to escape it. As I did so, as quick as a flash, there shot out a long tentacle from this mass of floating blubber, 
and it fell as light and sinuous as a whiplash across the front of my machine. There was a loud hiss as it lay for a moment across the hot engine and it whisked itself into the air again, while the huge, flat body drew itself together as if in sudden pain. I dipped to a vol peak, but again a tentacle fell over the monoplane and was shorn off by the propeller as easily as it might have cut through a smoke reef. A long, gliding, sticky, serpent-like coil came from behind and caught me round the waist, dragging me out of the fuselage. I tore at it, my fingers sinking into the smooth, glue-like surface, and for an instant I disengaged myself, but only to be caught round the boot by another coil, which gave me a jerk that tilted me almost onto my back. <clears throat> As I fell over, I blazed off both barrels of my gun, though indeed it was like attacking an elephant with a pea shooter to imagine that any human we weapon could cripple that mighty bulk. And yet I aimed better than I knew, for with a loud report, one of the great blisters upon the creature's back exploded with the puncture of the buckshot. It was very clear that my conjecture was right, and that these vast, clear bladders were distended with some lifting gas. For in an instant, the huge, cloud-like body turned sideways, writhing desperately to find its balance, while the white beak snapped and gaped in horrible fury. But already, I had shot away on the steepest glide that I dared to attempt. My engine still full on, the flying propeller and the force of gravity shooting me downward like an aerolite. Far behind me I saw a dull, purplish smudge growing swiftly smaller and merging into the blue sky behind it. I was safe, out of the deadly jungle, out of the outer air. Once out of danger, I throttled my engine, for nothing tears a machine to pieces quicker than running on full power from a height. It was a glorious spiral volplane from nearly 8 miles of altitude, first to the level of the silver cloud bank, then to that of the storm cloud beneath it, and finally, in beating rain, to the surface of the earth. I saw the Bristol Channel beneath me as I broke from the clouds, but Having still some petrol in my tank, I got 20 miles inland before I found myself stranded in a field half a mile from the village of Ashcombe. There, I got three tins of petrol from a passing motor car, and at 10 minutes past 6 that evening, I alighted gently in my own home meadow at Devies after such a long journey after such long journey as no mortal upon earth has ever yet taken and lived to tell the tale. I have seen the beauty, and I have seen the horror of the heights, and greater beauty or greater horror than that is not within the ken of man. And now, it is my plan to go once again before I give my results to the world. My reason for this is that I must surely have something to show by way of proof before I lay such a tale before my fellow men. It is true that others will soon follow and will confirm what I have said, and yet I should wish to carry conviction from the first. Those lovely iridescent bubbles of the air should not be hard to capture. They drift slowly upon their way, and the swift monoplane could intercept their leisurely course. It is likely enough that they would dissolve into the heavier layers of the atmosphere, and that some small heap of amorphous jelly might be all that I should bring to earth of me. And yet, something there would surely be by which I could substantiate my story. Yes, I will go, even if I run a risk by doing so. These purple horrors would not seem to be numerous. It is probably that I shall not see one. If I do, if I, do I shall dive at once. And the worst there is, I always got the shotgun and my knowledge of. Here, a page of the manuscript is unfortunately missing. On the next page is written in large, straggling writing. 43,000 feet. 
I shall never see earth again. They are beneath me, three of them. God help me, it is a dreadful death to die. Such in its entirety is the Joyce Armstrong statement. Of the man, nothing has since been seen. Pieces of his shattered monoplane have been picked up in the preserves of Mr. Bud Lushing in the preserves of Mr. Bud Lushington or upon the borders of Kent and Sussex. Within a few miles of the spot where the notebook was discovered. If the unfortunate aviator's theory is correct, that this air jungle, as he called it, existed only over the southwest of England, then it would seem uh, it, then it would seem that he had fled from it at full speed of his monoplane, but had been overtaken and devoured by these horrible creatures at some spot in the outer atmosphere above the place where the grim relics were found. The picture of that monoplane skimming down the sky with the nameless terrors flying as swiftly beneath it and cutting it off always from the earth while they gradually closed in upon their victim is one upon which a man who values his sanity would prefer not to dwell. There are many, as I am aware, who still jeer at the facts which I have set down, but even they must admit that Joyce Armstrong has disappeared, and I would commend to them his own words. This notebook may explain what I am trying to do and how I lost my life in doing it, but no drivel about accidents or mysteries, if you please. Bravo. Hey. Hopefully, that wasn't too bad. Cheers, Roka. Hmm. Yeah, that was great. Cheers. I was worried at the beginning because the person who wrote yeah who wrote the story about the story was very eccentric in his writing and I was worried it was going to be quite eccentric through most of it but luckily um Joyce what was his name Joyce Joyce Armstrong um Armstrong yep he was um he was a little easier to read so let's say that whoa yeah. that was i'm just thinking back on it man that's something so there's it's nice how you wrote this in like two different styles hmm. technically yep yeah one was that very elegant writing hey dragon welcome in welcome in yeah is that kind of yeah there was a lot of words in hey, there which were boss good to see you they probably wouldn't be easy for someone who didn't have english as their kind of first language and was well read in english as well it's more than just being a native speaker as well <laughs> like, like i say it was it oh, was yeah. unique language <laughs> I'm sitting there kind of going like, what have you put me in, Roka? <laughs> I just want to see what other ones we have. So in the Tales of Terror, we read the horror yeah, of the heights. It was like pretty old. There is the leather funnel. The New Catacomb, The Case of Lady Sanix, The Terror of Blue John Gap, and The Brazilian Cat. But this was... Ah, released 1996, from what I can see. But that is the um, Tales of Terror. There's also the Tales of Mystery, The Lost Special, The Beetle Hunter, The Man with the Watches, 
The Japan de Box. The Black Doctor. The Jew's Breastplate. Ooh. Mysterious. Yeah, they're also probably pretty good. I haven't read any of them. That's the work. But they're written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. That name's gotta be worth something. Hey, he's a knight, because he's he's been knighted, so he's Sir. Yep. Ah, uh, see that first one was very much, it was these huge paragraphs of text. Look at the next one, it's, there's a back and forth between people. You know, what then, I'll ask you now to take my funnel into your hands, da 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 da, -da. You make it a B, yeah, yes I do, so do I. There's a lot so of dialogue yep. in there. Yep, they're kind of, yep, forwards and back between people and then what happens, stuff, and then a bit more forwards and back dialogues. Interesting. It's one of these ones where you need to be able to see it to understand it because if i read like unless i changed the way i spoke it would be yeah you know, if i go oh actually let's just use this uh, oh that's like an so i have several ghosts the lever funnel has acted then i wouldn't sleep near the infernal things again for all the money you could offer me duck here chuckled and then i don't know who this is now i expected or maybe it's i expected that you would give a lively night of it Said he, you took it out of me in return for that scream of you. It's like, like it's jumping between people without saying, said so-and-so, quipped, whatever. It's like, that helps to know who said something. Yeah. Yeah, let's sound off so I'm not echoing back into my own ears. Well, it's good I chose one without any dialogue. Yeah, like, I don't mind reading dialogue, and I'm more than happy, like, obviously... I'm not going to use this as a dialogue voice. <laughs> but, it's a lot easier to tell, uh -huh. yeah. Like, I probably just adjust, like, as long as there's not too many characters, I'll just adjust my voice a small bit. Like, I'm definitely no voice actor, but I can at least change it a small bit without kind of hurting myself too much but yeah oh let me make sure i'm sitting upright again oh yep big stretch oh, oh, little post church oh. yep check poster check but yeah i'm gonna sit more kind of upright oh, here now Huh. Cheers, yeah. dragon. Cheers. <sighs> but yeah, just been thinking because yeah, I was going to celebrate the new job with um going to get some McDonald's. I was going to do that tomorrow for dinner, so it would be the McDonald's with um the beer i'm gonna have then i've figured um yeah i'm pretty sure i said on stream last stream they got the new job or we you may not have been at the stream at that point yet <clears throat> yeah he said it yesterday yeah i don't think you had quite joined us yet but oh, hell yeah grass let's let's have some food roker hom nom 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 delicious delicious yeah i don't know i can't remember technically when it starts but even once it starts I won't be, because it's a new job within the same company, it doesn't technically start immediately because there's then my existing job, which then needs to be um, hired for. 
because you know my existing job hasn't gone anywhere so i'll still be doing my existing job at the new pay rate while you know hiring yeah, someone to the position yeah. still needs to be filled yep whereas the new position that i've got doesn't need to be filled immediately because it's already been done by myself in the current role as well a, a small bit not to the same level as what i could do when it is my only job because it's my only job then it's like i could focus on it so much which will be so good can really just like sink my teeth into things and just yeah oh it's gonna be so good writing up documents and reports and doing cool shit cool shit with technology can i get my there you go that's better now it looks like i'm leaning kind of towards you roka that looks a lot more friendly uh, i was my um my body was leaning away from you which kind of looked a bit weird but i was kind of turned towards you so yeah my head was looking at you my body was looking away But yeah, I figured the grog, I'm going to have that on Sundays because I've got, you have to buy, unfortunately you can't just buy one mm. can of grog. I also seem to be like a lot bigger than you. Well, you're, you're always bigger than me. The, like, well, see, I always made sure you were slightly yeah, bigger than me. but like more so than usual. I don't think that's more than usual. I gave you like a few inches more. Hmm, maybe it's just me. I, I haven't adjusted it at all. Like, it's... It is what it is. Like, if I sit up for a bit more, I get a bit taller. Like, um, I am slumping a bit, see? Like, that's up, the slump. <laughs> like, even though I've posture checked, I am still slumping. So I'm sitting here slumping. Because Herpertus and Dragon, can you believe it? Can you absolutely believe it? Yeah. Can you? Let's see if they can believe it first. Yep, you have to believe because... And if, and if you... It is Friday once again. Hell yeah. Yep. Just got to remind people and do it a lot more this time to make up for last week. We missed that last week. We forgot it was Friday and we didn't believe it at all. Can you believe that we didn't believe it was Friday last week? How embarrassing. Yep. Absolute failures of a streamer, aren't we, Roka? What? Yeah, we've brought shame <laughs> yep. upon our families. Yep. It's time to commit Sudoku. Haha. <laughs> but yeah. Oh yeah, I said earlier, talking on Sudoku. Didn't do any more programming um today um towards it. But next week I do have my working from home days, so there'll be a lot more time next week to throw quite some time and ability to think and troubleshoot into it. Nice. But actually, yes, I should get it into um, the GitHub as well right now, just in case there's any risk of losing it. You never know. Good idea to back up your stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not a full backup because it doesn't back up the project files. So the actual, you know, the boxes and all that kind of stuff that's placed, you know, in the map. But it at least, like, yeah. It just gets it there, which is nice. Like, I'd rather not have to reprogram it. I'd be more happy to kind of go, hey, you know what? I just have to create, you know, thousands of little um, flat planes and cubes again and just link them all together. That I can do with these. Oof. Is 
let's see, I'm trying to redo it. Yeah. The problem with the project files onto Git, and technically it would work because it would just be a backup, it's the physical size of them is the issue. That let me just quickly check the properties. That it's 24,000 files weighing in at 2 gigs or 2.09 gigs. Hey, thanks for stopping by, Dragon. Hopefully, works awesome for you today. Okay, good luck at work, Vaz. See you. The problem is, Batplet, the metadata is very important for all of it. Because let's say you've got a texture and the texture file you have is 8,000 pixels by 8,000 pixels. But in the metadata, it says compress it down to 256 by 256, like heavily compress it and make it super lightweight. Then it's it's not it's not an 8K by 8K texture, which would cripple any machine. It's actually a 256 by 256, but you've still got some original texture, which is super HD. Which, obviously not a great way to do things. There's probably better ways you should probably compress it in other software, but still have an original and not do all that. But that's outside of the idea. You can do that. I just need to check how much I can actually put into the git before it goes like, what are you doing? That's dumb. Or a better option, I can right click on it and say just compress a zip file. Compress it to a singular zip file and go, done. I'll upload that. Oh, actually, I could do that now just quickly and just see what it turns into. Let's see, 7-zip. Oh, I just want to see what I it guess compresses we're doing to. It live. I just want to see what it compresses to. We'll just run the background. See what the compression ratio is on it. Yeah, it'll just do its thing. Yeah, I wonder if there's ways to split up the development more. So opposed to, um, you know, people having to work in the entirety of everything you have someone who literally just has the character models and they're dealing with the animations. They're just getting animations loaded against them. And once they're done, they'll, you know, into the Git or whatever they're using, you know, upload, hey, it's, you know, the Roker character, the Beta character, the Batler character, and here's the animation sets and here's their textures and here's the model files. And, you know, then you'll have the next team which will go, hey, here is the level layout and all that kind of stuff. And they'll be putting that into their space. Then you'll have maybe the world builder who will go, cool, I'll take the level space. I'll put the characters in as spawn points. I'll, you know, get the sound people and put in where the sound should all activate. And you know, there's someone to kind of bring it together. That would be my guess is what you would do. I think you might be able to git ignore by folder structure as well. That you could literally git ignore, say, the level layout and only um, pick up the, you know, the character section. Here we go. So it has compressed from the two gigs down to 830 megabytes. I guess because it's all metadata, it's a whole bunch of text. That's neat.
Unfortunately, we've hit the technology again. I'm sorry, Roka. Haha. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Without looking anything up, Roka, and this will be a challenge You're for you now. You're the one now. who has to keep talking after reading that story. <laughs> yep. That's all good. Um... Here's one. Here's a challenge for you, and you're not allowed to look anything up. And so you, it's fine to say, I don't know as well. That's a perfectly fine answer for this. What's the latest aeroplane news? Oh, shit. Um. There was this one plane recently. From, I think, some Asian airline that got into heavy turbulence. Mm -hmm. And I think a person died and several got injured. Oh, that's definitely not good. Like Was needing it? emergency surgeries and stuff. Right, because they got kind of banged around, like they went up, they hit the roof, bat down again, and really... Like even little kids and everything. <laughs> yeah, I've seen like one picture where like all the panels came flying off inside the plane and stuff was dangling down. Yeah, that is... Looked really bad. Yeah, that sounds horrible. That I know my granddad used to, I think he was Air Force and used to actually um like repair the planes. He was like the head engineer. And he did a bit at Fiji Ooh. Airlines and stuff like that. So that's cool. Yep. So like, yeah, so he's got that kind of stuff. And yeah, always said to um my mum, so it's my granddad from my mum's side. Um, yeah, when you're flying on a plane, never take your seatbelt off. Unless you have to stand up to do something, it never comes off. Even if the sign says, you know, you can take that off when you that's when you're flying, don't take it off. It stays on at all times. Cause it takes hitting one bit of turbulence. Yeah, I mean while you're sitting down. You might as well just leave it on. Yep. Like you can loosen it a small bit, you know, you don't have to have it pulling tight against you. But it needs to be still strapping you in. Yeah. It's also tight enough to keep you mm. in your seat. Yep. On a jet plane roker, have you ever been near enough to the front to see the um, seat belts that the flight attendants get on like a larger plane? Like an A320 kind of thing? Like an A320 mm. size plane. I've been pretty close to the front ones. That was when I was flying to Turkey. Mm -hmm. But I don't specifically remember their their seat seat belts. So I once managed on an A320 to get row one right at the very front. Super awesome because there's leg room for days. Damn. Like, you could be seven foot tall, and your legs would not be able to reach the other side. Like, there is so much space, it's amazing. And I, I got so lucky in that seat, I don't know how I got it. But, um, yeah, it, like, I know everyone on the plane sitting there with this thin little lap belt on them, and the, um, the flight attendants are sitting there with, like, a three-point harness, like, one coming up between their legs and one over each shoulder. It's like... Hold up. <laughs> You've got that and I've got this wee little lap belt. What? So if something goes wrong, you ain't moving. You're going to be pretty safe there. And look at me. I'm going to yeah, come half of this little thing. The thing is they have to be the ones who stay safe. Yep. <laughs> because they are the ones evacuating the plane in an emergency. Yep. <laughs> it's just... I know. It just seems like... Can you imagine how terrified people would be if you had so to get into a plane? So it's more to keep them alive. And it was almost like a um an amusement ride, like on a roller coaster, where like above you, you pull down, like you know, the thing goes clonk, clicks in, and it just locks you in place. <laughs> they.
that would be something else where you've actually got a, like or a three point harness kind of thing we have got three pieces going across here i think is that the right term for a three point harness when you've got each shoulder and one between your legs kind of clipping to a point i think so yeah I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. Because hmm. I know I've heard of a six-point harness as well, and I'm guessing there must just be other points on it that maybe go, like, round your waist or something. I just can't imagine where exactly they'd go, but they must go somewhere. But yeah, kind of... Hmm. Yeah, there would be two over your shoulders, three around your waist. And like I don't know, two around your thighs. Or maybe like one coming up from the middle and one over your thighs. One, two, three, four. Something like that. I'm trying to figure out how to fit six things around you. I believe so, Bapler. So we're just saying a 3.1 is you would have one strap coming up from between your legs and then one over each shoulder. And that's your kind of, and you know, it clips in the middle, like across your belly. And that's your three point harness. So we're trying to figure out what a 6.1 is. So if we went, you know, one across each shoulder. So that's two. Third one's going to go between your legs. So now there's four, five, and six. So there's three more. Two of them are probably going to be like, say, yeah, left, left and right. Yeah, then you have yep. like two around your waist. Yep, so that's four and five. And where's number six go? So there's one more. Just a singular one. And then maybe one across your thighs or something. Actually, yeah, as Bapla says, a pair around each leg. So that one that I was saying going through legs isn't what, and it's actually two. Kind of dealing with the legs. Hmm. That makes sense. So you're really just locked in place. You're not no. going anywhere. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, those two around the waist. Is like, yeah, one on each side of the waist, one in the thigh. So you, you can't bang left and right at all. You kind of, you just sit in there. Oh yeah, jumping on tech stuff. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back to it, but something you might be interested in, Roka. It was released just slightly earlier today, was a Linus Tech Tips video series on de yourself. So, you know, oh. releasing your ties from, like, one of the biggest tech companies out there. So you're not reliant on their stuff and actually you owning your own stuff and not selling it to or having it sold to other people. Oh, Which, is a good idea. Hmm. Because Google are not in, and it's kind of a very common thing they've done to delete services they offer that they go, hey, we've got this cool new thing, go and use it. And it's really awesome. It does this cool feature and it's super awesome. And then one day they put our message saying, hey, um, we don't do this anymore. It's been deleted. And you're like, okay. Um, they're like, you can get your data here if you want your data, but that's about it. And it's just like, oh, I guess we're not using them anymore. So yeah, they have killed a lot of services. Well
But yeah, it's just kind of, it's nice to not be reliant on, yeah, someone else. When you can go like, hey, you know what? I'm going to self-host or, you know, you don't have to use Google Chrome. Yeah, there is that Google Graveyard website and it's, it's not a small website either. They have killed off a lot of things. Ugh, poster check again. I can't be slumping forever. But yeah, I know you use Firefox, which is already a good start. And the key thing they kind of left at the end of the video and the other people were saying in the comments, don't do all of it at once. It's not possible. Do it piece by piece, one step Why at a time that? slowly. Because if I said, hey, you, you know, you have a Gmail account that you've had for the past, you know, 15, 20 years, delete it and start again with a new um, email address. And suddenly all okay, these other then. things. D -pad. Hey, D-pad, welcome in, welcome in. You know, say like, hey, change from this service over to this. And now you've got to like change all these things. It's like, it's, it's a lot to change. Yep. You're just going to hit frustration. Just give up and go, you know what? Google's actually rather convenient. But you go, hey, I'll change just one thing. Like for me, my kind of latest thing was I um, set Firefox yeah, on my phone. You gotta manage your frustration level. Yeah, I set Firefox on my phone as my default browser. Initially, it was like, uh, uh, but. You know, I got over it and now I love it. It's actually great. Because it's not Google anymore. And I can have um all of my um, plugins in it as well on my phone. Which is so good. And it's not limited now by nice. the new Manifest V3 for plugins. Oh, yes. You, you know Manifest V3 or not, Roker? Is that a word you've never heard of before in your life? No. Okay, so Google Chrome and Firefox and a bunch of other browsers used to work on Manifest V2 uh, for plugins. And what it meant is you could have advert blockers and all the other good stuff, which had access to heaps of things in your web browser, could do lots of cool things. Google have releasing slash have released, I don't know if they've done it yet, but very soon, maybe already now, um, Manifest V3, which severely hampers advert blockers' abilities because they just don't have the same level of access in it. Now, it probably provides speed boosts here and there and various other things, but it also causes problems. So Firefox have said, yeah, we're sticking with V2. That's it. So you can keep doing what you're doing. And I think they're looking at ways of being able to support both V2 and V3 at the same time so you can get, you know... The new ones, which may, you know, V3 may enable certain features as well, but it also hampers others. So I think they're looking at kind of having both in there. But yeah, it just means, yeah. So yeah, there's security improvements too, yep. Yeah, just, yeah, so the extensions have less permissions, but it also hampers the extensions as well because they can't get as many permissions to do what they need to do. Yeah, makes sense. So it's kind of that double-edged sword, but yeah, I've, uh, I, I look up that way and obviously you can't see, but my cell phone's sitting just over that way, so. I'm looking at my cell phone and I'm talking about it. I see. Good old Sally the cell phone. But yeah, along with that, it was then also changing. You gave your cell phone a name? Uh, well, I occasionally call her Sally just because it's Sally the cell phone. But my work phone is called Alice. Uh. 
or it was called Alice. I don't think it's, I think it's just called like Samsung A23 now, but I should rename it to Alice. Because it was named after Alice in Wonderland. Because when I got a work phone a few oh. years ago, um, I got I got it and um, had to go on a work trip pretty soon afterwards. And I didn't know where I was going. I was in a city I've never been in. So kind of like Alice in Wonderland, you know, getting lost and then kind of finding her way again. I was in a city, I got lost and kind of found my way again, thanks to Alice who found my way through the city. Well, Google Maps nice. did, but... I like that. That's why she's called Alice. It's also really convenient in the mobile device management portal. Every other phone's called like Samsung something or other, and Alice sits at the top of the list. Alphabetically as before everything. Haha. <laughs> -ha. Open up, there's my phone. Good old Alice. But yeah, with my cell phone as well, when I'm, say, watching, like, YouTube and stuff like that, say, in the morning or at night, just during dinner and breakfast, I put it on my wallet because my wallet has, like, a bit of a thicker kind of um, backside to it. So it sits at a slight angle, so it angles the phone towards me, which is convenient. And so it's Wally the wallet. Sally the cell phone and Wally the wallet. Hey... <laughs> I'm a bit of an idiot, I know. But you got to have fun in life. It's good we're all idiots here. Yeah. <laughs> Friendly zone. Mm -hmm. This is an idiot friendly zone. But yeah, some other things out of the Lions Tech Tips video, looking at other um, search engines. So, you know, alternatives to using Google to search for things. As well as they had alternatives to Google Photos as well. So, you know, storing your photos in other places. Is there anything else that really stood out? Yep, DuckDuckGo was a browser that they um put up there. So... They, you know, they talked about, you know, a few browsers. They didn't dive into them deeply, but kind of went through the basics of, you know, what they offer. And, you know, what you might get out of each one. And it's really, there is no correct answer for what one you pick. Because let's say, Roku, you go, hey, um. I've always wanted that one feature. And I don't know, um... Brave Browser has that one feature I've always wanted and it does it and it's privacy centric or you go oh hey maybe DuckDuckGo has that one thing that I want there's no correct answer to what what there is yeah so everyone has mm. to find the one thing that's right for them. Yep, you gotta find what's right for you. There's no as they 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 made sure with everything that say, oh, for your web browser use Firefox, for this use that, for that use this. It's <clears throat> sorry, I've been been speaking a lot. It's oops, sorry, bang the mic, my bad. Cheers. Mm. Cheers. <clears throat> Yeah, they made sure they kept it pretty open with all the things they talked about. Just kind of for everything they talked about, they made sure they had, you know, three, four options at least. <clears throat> like, they'd usually talk about three or four of, like, the bigger players in the alternative market. And then they would give, like, like a shout-out to the small ones saying, hey, there's also this, 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 and this. Go look into them if you want. But yeah, we've got some uh, exciting stuff coming up next week for 
continuing on Vermintide and a new game as well. But you'll have to wait until next week to find out what it is. I'm focused, I'll scratch your head going, what? what? <laughs> but maybe, maybe yeah, you recognize what I'm saying. a friend just informed me that there's some sort of event going on. What? Is it just event? gonna pass this message through to you. Oh, okay. That's what we're doing, right? That is indeed what we're doing. Because we still got these last three missions. Uh, two missions. We've only got two missions left. In Vermintide 1. Yep. Yeah, so then for the oh. next game, there's only two missions left in Vermintide 1. And then for the next game, then it looks like there's an event on as well. So it's going to be a game with an event happening as well, which is going to be cool. New game with an event. Hell yeah. Roka, do you know if you can get Grog over where you are? Just gonna ask them how long this goes on for. Hmm, let me check. I guess there's the other question of, do you like sweet alcoholic drinks as well? Because I'm pretty sure Grog is something different where I come from. Oh, I mean the cold ones, Grog. So grog is probably something, but I mean the cold ones, um, alcohol called grog. Ah, uh, I only know the hot beverage with rum. Yeah, so that's probably the, you know, the drink of hot beverage with rum, but they have made a product they've called grog, which is a mixed, I guess, alcopop or RTD, maybe. Is it spelled the same? G-R-O-G. Hmm, I can't seem to find it here. Let's see. It may not no, have made it. I'm only finding the rum one. Okay, so it hasn't made it that far kind of around the world yet. Because, yeah, it's Australian based and it's made it here. I think it's kind of <clears throat> making it a bit further north as well out of Australia. But, yeah, I guess it hasn't made it all the way around the world Wait, to you yet. It's Australian based? Well,. Cold Ones is, you know, it's a YouTube thing um, Interesting. run by Australians. I wouldn't have guessed that. Did you see my picture in the munchies? Because of the Japanese writing on it. Oh, so do you know Filthy Frank and Joji and all that? I heard the names. Yes, so Filthy Frank, Joji are the same person. When he was Filthy Frank, he had some mates with him, which would do the silly stuff with him as well while he was Filthy Frank. And he split off and then did Joji and the music half. And they split off their way and did the Cold Ones podcast, but was still in Japan a bit as well because Filthy Frank was in Japan. That he was a Japanese Australian. So it's something like, because, you know, his mum was Australian and his dad was Japanese, I think. Yeah, that kind of thing, or the other way around. You know, I don't know the exact kind of thing, but he was in Japan. So he knew Japanese and they also knew Japanese as well, because they were, you know, a bunch of Australian mates all over in Japan. 
you know, having a grand old time. <laughs> So yeah, they probably have some Japanese knowledge behind them. So have you tried it? I've got is a, it um, actually any good? I've got a box of it. It is quite sweet. Um, so I've got the lemon one. It's quite sweet. It um has a good lemon flavor in it. It's not it's not obnoxious and it's not weak either. The lemon's a good strong lemon, but not so lemony that you turned inside with sourness. I'm guessing it does its job perfectly, being what well, American would probably call an Alco Pop. That if you concentrate, you can taste the alcohol, but if you don't, it's there's no alcohol flavor at all. It's gone. Um, yeah, and it's it's got some carbonation in it, so it's got a nice little bit of a fizz in there. Yeah, that's kind of the whole point of those things to yeah. hide the alcohol flavor. Yep. Yeah. But there's you know, zero burn. Obviously, it's a little 5%. You know, I'm going to call it like a 5% beer kind of thing. There's going to be no burn at all. It would be nice if it didn't hide the flavor so much. That it would be nice to get some of the... You know, and this is obviously, this is now me speaking. The interesting flavors of the alcohol coming through. If you could without making the product worse. Because I'm pretty sure, let me take a it was Sochu and um, Vodka, was it? Uh... Yep, that's what it says here. Yep, Vodka, Sochu, Lemon Juice, Concentrate, and then things that kind of keep it preserved and good. The nutritional values given are based on theoretical calculations. Hmm. Interesting. But yeah, the fact that they put the ingredients list on the back is so good because normally with alcohol, you don't have to put um, ingredients lists on them because it's not... It's not classed as like a food product here in New Zealand. So like when you think of wine, they don't have an ingredients list on the back and all of the like the energy, the protein, all the required things they you have to put on an actual food product. Because I think because it is alcohol, but the fact that they've done that is actually kind of cool. So it means you can see, you know, everything they've put in it. So yeah, so outside of the That's vodka, always interesting. yeah, so you you know they put in vodka, 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 sochu, lemon juice concentrate, and then they have the acidity regulators, a tiny bit of citric acid. Cool, it's just gonna, you know, get the kind of lemony just right. Trisodium citrate, I think it gets pretty similar to citric acid again. Tartaric acid again, that's got that kind of not not a fizz to it, but like it's gonna be a bit sour, which will be cool. They say natural flavors, whatever that means. Unfortunately, natural flavors is a um an interesting subject. Uh, preservatives, so potassium sorbate. Again, um, you see that you know if you buy juices and stuff like that, some of them will have potassium sorbate in it as a preservative. And a sweetener, sucralose. Okay, it's just sugar. Yep, pretty standard stuff. Yep, there's nothing in there that you really go like, what the hell is that? Like, why is that in there? And the preservative, the only reason why you'd put that in there is just to stop it um, fermenting further. Because it's the one thing, if you want to make your own alcohol, easiest way, go to Sumarket and just buy a bottle of, like, apple juice. Just make sure it doesn't say preservative on the ingredients list and just apple juice. <clears throat> buy some brewer's yeast, whack it in there. Or if you do have a better bottle, put in a better bottle first. You know, add a whole bunch of sugar, mix it all up, put a lid on with a airlock on it, let it do its thing. 
it'll go and make sure your bottle's cleaned and just clean it with potassium sorbate. Hey, fancy and that. And then you've got your booze after a while. Yeah. And you just measure the gravity before and afterwards. <coughs> oh, sorry. My, my voice is starting to go. I don't know how much more I can speak. <laughs> But yeah, you measure your gravity, so the yeah, gravity measures... you've done a lot of talking today. Mm. Gravity measures the amount of sugar in a liquid, and that helps define then, um, yeah, how much alcohol is in there. In voila, you have, like, an apple cider kind of thing. If you picked apple juice... And like you go fancy, buy a juicer and buy like a whole bunch of, I don't know, grapes and oranges and other things and mush them all up and put them through a juicer, get the juice, ferment it and see what pops out the other end. You know, more power to you. And it, it will ferment, <laughs> pretty much. Add, add the yeast, add sugar. Just don't expect brilliance. <laughs> It takes a lot to create brilliance. Oh yeah, it will be some sort of alcohol. Mm -hmm. Does a banana produce a lot of juice out of a juicer? Like technically they feel kind of dry, but I'm guessing there must be some sort of juice in them, right? Is there some sort of juice? Not a whole lot though. I have to search this. Juicing a banana. It's definitely possible. Yep. I guess this must need a lot of bananas kind of thing. I would be interested juicing up a banana to like, get the juice. You can just straight up buy banana juice. Yeah. And fermenting it. Yeah, I don't see why not. Fermenting banana juice. It's probably a little ineffective due to how many bananas you would need. Hmm. But... Like... But other than that, totally feasible. But like you could do a strawberry wine or something. Ooh, a strawberry wine. Ooh, nice. Like that's the thing. You get to pick what you want. Do you want a kiwi fruit wine? Like it's yeah. But with how my voice is going. Yeah, you could make hmm. wine out of all sorts of fruits. Yeah. I'm going to have to call it here and say I can't go much further with my voice. It's working at the moment, but I can feel it's right yeah, on the edge of kind of... it's almost 1 p.m. Yep, right on the edge of slipping off of me. It's nearly 11 p.m. as well for me. Let's not abuse your voice any further. Yep. So yeah. And start wrapping things up, you. Yep. Want to give a shout out to everyone who stopped by and made this an awesome stream. So I want to give a shout out to Batpler. So thank you, Batpler, for stopping by. Much appreciated. Thank you, Eddie, as well, who stopped by near the beginning. A Roka jumped in chat for a small bit. So lovely to see you here as well, Roka. Dragon Vols stopped in before they had to head off for Happy work. Happy to be here. Yep, Apertus came in and they believed and they definitely believed that it was um, a special time. We'll come back to that as well. And D-Pad has also stopped in a bit as well. So thank you, D-Pad. And everyone who's still here, can you all believe it? Yeah, thank you for tuning in, everyone. Can you all believe it? 
Can you believe it, Roka? I can. Cool. Can you? I can also believe it because... Haha, <laughs> it is indeed Friday once again. Hell yeah, it's the weekend. Yep, it is the weekend once again. Cheers to that. Haha, <laughs> indeed. Cheers, Roka. Just looking, there is no one streaming at the moment. Although, I do see someone who's streaming. Who um, I'm wondering. Let's see if I can find someone. If you don't have someone, I do have virtual going up um, Deep Dip 2. So if you do have someone who you care about, you sure. guys want to see some track mania. Yep. Otherwise, I do have some track mania, which is pretty cool because it's one hell of a track, and he's been doing this one level for 157 hours. Well, I'm seeing this one person who's doing like three DV tuber commissions, missions. But I'm not sure if I care about them much. I've only stumbled upon them. I guess it's, it's your core, Roka. I'm gonna put the name in chat. Okay. Oh, okay. I think we've done Shonzo before, haven't we? I stopped following them. If you them. want to give it a quick look. I don't know if I stopped following them. Let me have a quick look. Hmm. Yes, I think they're the one I stopped following. Oh, let's mute them up. I think they're the one I stopped following. Because we've been there once before. Oh, okay. I can never remember who we've already raided. I still have some of them followed, so... But it depends on some of them. Like, some of them I've unfollowed, but like, Nevera, I'm never unfollowing. Shonzo, I didn't feel like I got anything from them. Like, there's Ruka, who I'm still following. Nevera. Uh, I don't think there's anyone else we've raided, really. Yeah, fair enough. I think we heard some track mania, which should be pretty good. Ah, pirate off is on, but I don't think he needs to boost. I think we go for something a bit more easier oh, to watch. I can hear some heavy thundering outside. It's oh. gonna be raining. Oh well, how about we do things before? Any um, lightning takes out your um, your internet or your house or anything like that, just in case. Just to be on the safe side. So, I'm going to say we head over Virtual's direction. Sounds good. Let's go. Yep. Why not? So, thank you everyone who stopped by. It is much appreciated for everyone who's um, came in and who has also left. Um... Yeah, hope everyone who has joined us has an absolutely wonderful um, rest of their day, uh, morning, evening, night, midday, yep. all hope that. Hope you all have an amazing weekend. Yep, yeah, hope your weekend does go great. So yeah, we'll see you all again on Monday next week. And with that, let's fire yep. in see you guys. the details.
and we'll get the raid started and going through there it is and there we go there we go hold on and off we go bye 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 Real love is not like how you see it in the Disney movies and stuff. Real love is when you gift a hundred subs to a streamer and have them read out your name. Oh Jesus, God, you're a billionaire. we're gonna be drowning in...